there. Now we'll talk about penicontemporaneous structures and that just means that it happens at the time of deposition. And some of the basic ones that are kind of important to recognize are debris flows which have this chaotic poorly sorted kind of cross section you can see here um, because they don't have a chance to sort and they don't settle out the same way a turbidite does. A debris flow is different than a turbidite because we talked about a turbidite which can happen in much the same way uh, but it's able to settle out and you can see a little picture here I've got of huge debris flows. It's it's important to realize how big that they can be. Uh, there are ancient debris flows documented in Wyoming that moved mountain sized blocks several kilometers so we need to understand this can be a huge regional um, contributor to the formations that we're looking at and this is how you recognize them. You look up here you see all these poorly sorted chunky uh, angular class floating in your matrix and you understand that that is not normal sedimentary deposition so it's something to recognize. And then you have a very interesting occurrence. You have slumping folds and they can be very confusing because what do we think when we see folds? We think tectonic activity. A slumping fold does not do at all to tectonic activity. Let's take for instance that on your continental slope you have sedimentary um, action taking place on a slope. It's not totally horizontal. And so you've got some of your gravity vector heading down slope um, instead of being normal to the ground surface. And what this creates is the desire for your sediment to roll downhill. Now there's some electrostatic cohesion, there's cohesion to your sediment, so let's pretend you've got this this buildup that is kind of half consolidated and then there's um, an avalanche or an earthquake and all of a sudden everything wants to flow downhill but it's not loose enough anymore to flow downhill like a turbidite it's too consolidated for that so you see here it just kinda slumps down and it creates these asymmetric wrinkly uh, folds that you have to be able to recognize as being what it is, a gravity driven slump, and not due to tectonic forces. Now what's the most obvious indicator of that in this picture? I think if you look at it long enough you're gonna see, if you haven't already, what the easiest way to recognize this is. Notice that the beds above it, and more importantly the beds below it, which were obviously there at the time this folding took place, have not been folded with this slump. And that's what you're going to have to find to convince yourself that this took place due to gravity and not due to tectonic forces. And it's one of the most important ways to recognize that. But slumping folds can be very interesting looking little boogers, so it's uh, good to know that they exist and that you might expect to see them. Now, we're going to talk about salt structures. There's a lot of salt in the world, and salt structures can be economically important, they can be regionally important, and salt has a lot of interesting properties that causes it to behave in interesting ways. When salt moves, you know, we've been talking about this density difference, and, and you, you create this buoyancy of an underlying less dense uh, material. Um, when salt moves due to gravity alone, we call that halokinesis and halo obviously comes from the salt kinesis from movement. So this is the movement of salt and it doesn't take a disturbance. All it takes is gravity driven density differences. Now salt has an interesting property that it is not only, a, it's very weak. It's very weak and it's prone to behave in a ductile way um, but it's also just like water has the interesting property of becoming less dense when it freezes. Salt becomes less dense as it sinks because it gets heated up. It sinks into the earth and at depth it gets heated up and there's a little bit of expansion. And so you've got salt that can be quite a bit less dense than the rock that overlies it. And as the overburden gets heavier it creates pressure on the salt and there is often times a lot of movement. That is how salt sneaks its way up to the surface. And uh, if you've seen any salt structures you know what I'm talking about. There's some interesting salt volcanoes, salt explosions, I mean just salt likes to come back up to the surface. Now 
when we talk about upbuilding, we can we can look at this little cartoon here and see that upbuilding is when the overburden starts to squish the salt and it bubbles up and distorts the um, the bedding above it, breaks it apart, it can cause lots and lots of faults and um, interesting things and it can pop up above. So when it builds up, we call that upbuilding. Now, downbuilding is a little less intuitive of a turn, but, term, but we can see it here as sedimentation takes place and the pressure on the salt is increased, the salt rises along with the sedimentary deposits. Okay, so what this means is that as more weight is applied, your salt keeps on creeping up with you. Notice that there is less deformation of the surrounding, um, the surrounding layers. And so we call that down building. And um, I suppose it's just because we already had the term up building and it was nice to have sort of opposite term. But, you know, it still makes some sense because the distance between this source layer and this continues to increase so it continues to be deeper and deeper whereas you know this cartoon's not as clear but this doesn't necessarily uh, stay as deep as it is this entire source layer may move up through the through the formation and so it doesn't necessarily get deeper and deeper as the sediment is deposited okay now um here is some of the terminology sort of depicted here. So all this white stuff is our salt. We get little salt tongues, salt diapirs that rise up. Don't call them salt diapers. They're salt diapirs. Um, you get these little salt bulbs. These are the stalks. And we have a little detached tongue. Um, and then you can have the salt actually come to the surface and pop up like our little sand volcanoes before. So this might look familiar to you and it, it makes sense. Um, Salt is a common evaporitic deposit. We know that. So it usually happens in sedimentary basins. Now, ask yourself why this is, uh, why it's so common, for instance, uh, on the ocean floor. Uh, one of the most common ways for salt to form is this. As rifting begins to take place in a continent, um, you have a rift valley, and then eventually you have, what, freshwater lakes and so on. You're not going to get a lot of salt from that. But pretty soon, that rift valley area, that rift area, is going to drop below sea level. And when that happens, you're going to get saline water. Now, since this is not an open ocean environment, if you've got high evaporitic rates, even seasonally, you're going to precipitate out a ton of salt because when water evaporates, your, your saline water becomes oversaturated with salt. Only so much salt can be in solution. And so if you reduce the amount of water, it's going to precipitate out salt at the bottom uh, in the basin of this uh, saline water basin. So over time, let's just say you have a really, really dry season and all the water evaporates out or, or half of it and you make a deposit and then it fills up with water again, but that, that salt's already been buried so it's not back in solution. It's got new salt. and You have these events repeat themselves. And this is why you have a ton of salt that accumulates in these sedimentary basins. And it's just important to understand that because you need to know that salt is more common on these right here, these passive continental margins. Well, where did a passive continental margin come from? It came because it's tailing, it's it's trailing away from this rift valley environment. So if you ask yourself where to look for salt and why to look there for salt, there's your answer. Okay, now we can move forward and look at a little more um, of the associated salt, salt structures you might expect to find. And you're going to see a lot of times when it's on the shelf environment, because the shelf environment is sloped, salt is very soft like we talked about and when you've got heavy deposits on a soft layer and it's on a slope you are just asking for it to slide and Lystric faults are sort of the the more consolidated version of those slumping folds we looked at it wants to slide down it's gonna slide down it's too heavy not to slide down and so it's gonna fault in this characteristic concave up pattern in little pie pieces and as they come down, you can kind of picture this happening. The pressure pushing against this, and as it pushes against this, this wants to bubble up, and that's called a rollover fold. So, Lystric faults and rollover folds, of course, they're not 
only related to salt, but they're easily related to salt because imagine if this layer right here, this, this under layer, say, is a soft salt layer, then it's going to be really easy for sliding to occur over it. And so those are often associated. And also because salt is so common on those sloped continental margins. And then you see here, as a salt diapir, a very large one, um, is pushed up through a formation, it's going to cause a very complex array of fractures. And if these flac fractures make it through to the surface, or at least affect the surface, they may be difficult to interpret without understanding what is going on underneath them. And of course it may not be salt causing it, but salt often does. Uh, you can think of other things that could rise and cause this, like a pluton of, of magma. Um, but it's important to recognize that it often happens in associ association with salt because salt often rises because of its density difference.